Okay, today we're going to be learning about the accounting cycle. So, why do we want to learn about the accounting cycle? The reason is the accounting cycle is what allows us to take a lot of different information, a lot of data, and turn it into meaningful financial reports. So if you think about H&R Block, this is a service company, and if you look at that third bullet point there, it says it had a retail office within five miles of most Americans. This means there are a lot of H&R Block offices. And inside each of those offices, we've got clients coming in, we're preparing tax returns for them, we pay maybe office rent for the space, we pay utilities expense, we pay taxes, we pay our employees for their salaries. A lot of transactions are happening every day all across America and even in some other countries. So we're going to take all that data and actually turn it into a financial statement such as this one. This is H&R Block's 2014 income statement. And if you look there, it says that revenues were $2,999,460,000. So we had to categorize and summarize all of the um, different locations' revenues and make it um, on this one report. And then for expenses, we have um, field wages, other wages. Then we have some marketing and advertising expenses, some depreciation, some bad debt, all these different expenses that we had to summarize to be able to report to the financial statements. All right, so the accounting cycle, that's how we do this. It's going to start off with analyzing these transactions. And then if you look down in step number seven, it's going to um, prepare the financial reports like the one that you just saw. And then at the very end of it is when we get the accounts ready for the next period to start the whole process over again. So this is step 1 through 10, the accounting cycle. So let's take each step individually. The first one says transactions are analyzed and recorded in a journal. So the transaction, for example, H&R Block prepared a corporate tax return. The analysis, what is the financial impact of that? Well, we received cash and it was revenue. So the two accounts that we would affect would be cash and revenue. We would record this in a journal where we would show that cash increased by $699 and service revenue increased by $699. And we would do this with debits and credits, which we learned in Chapter 2. And there's actually a tutorial on debits and credits if you would like to review those rules and how to um, use debits and credits. It is available right here. Hello. This video is going to explain debits and credits for accounting. I'm going so, to forward it there's so that you a can little get a bit good idea. Uh, your account how it works. is going to have a left side and it's going to have a right side, every one of them. And in accounting, we call the left side a debit. That stands for debere, which is Latin for left. On the right side, we're going to call it the credit. So every single account on the left is a debit, on the right is a credit. What changes is which side increases it. So we said that in this situation we need cash to go up. Well, because cash is on the left of this equal sign, cash goes up on the left-hand side. Okay, so that is debits and credits, and you can watch that at any point. Um, so let's look at more at this, at this terminology in step one. So we're talking about a journal. What exactly do we mean? Well, if I was thinking about a journal for myself, it would be like my diary. So, for example, May 28th, today I woke up and took the dogs out, then I made coffee, I cooked breakfast, and fed the dogs and kids. That's my journal. Well, the journal for H&R Block would be the same thing, but it would be what happened to them financially. So on May 28th, their cash went up by that $6.99, and their revenue went up by $6.99. So a journal is just a listing of the transactions that happened to a company. Let's look at step number two. Transactions are then posted to the ledger. So here's your journal the listing of, the, of transactions, and then we're going to post those, which means copy it to the accounts, okay? The reason that we do this is because we need to find out how much is in each account. So this is what we mean by posting. I'm going to copy that $699, and I've done that for you right there on a post-it note, copy it out of that journal, and I'm going to copy it to the account or the bucket, and I'm going to place it in that bucket. So I'm going to place it into the cash account because I'm going to have this bucket available to see all of the transactions that happen to cash. I'm going to add them and subtract them all up to know what is inside that account. Now all these buckets together, all these accounts together, 
are called your ledger. I'm going to do the same thing for the credit side of that transaction. I'm going to place it in the service revenue account or bucket and there it goes. Alright, after I journalize and post, I always have to make sure that I did it correctly and that I put everything in the right bucket and added it and subtracted it right. So I do a trial balance. You can think of this as I am trying to see if I balance. So I'm going to add up all of my debits and all of my credits and see if I'm in balance. This number is the same as this number, so I can say that my debits equal my credits, so I am in balance. Step four says, I, do, I drew this little stick figure for us, and it says, hmm, what else has happened this month that I have not yet accounted for? So if I look at my trial balance so far, I've got cash, revenue, capital, but I haven't accounted for any salary expense. But look at the picture behind this trial balance. What do those look like? Yeah, H&R Block employees. So I'm thinking that they have worked, but I have not yet paid for them. So that's one of the adjusting journal entries that we learned about back in Chapter 3. And that's the one that we're going to use today as an example for this step. So my employees have worked, but I haven't paid them. So in order to see if this is the only journal entry that I need to make, I can do this optional spreadsheet. I look at my balance before the adjustment. I put in my adjustment where I'm going to increase salary payable and increase salary expense and then I can see what my balances will look like if I make this proposed adjustment. I can even see what my income statement and balance sheet would look like if I make this journal entry. Okay, so step six, I decide that yes, I want to make that adjusting journal entry. So I'm going to journalize right here. Then I'm going to post to my ledger. Okay, so this is the same thing as writing it down in my journal and then copying it into my buckets. Alright, after I journalize and post, the next step is always a trial balance. This one is called the adjusted trial balance because it is after we made our adjustment. So I look and my debits equal my credit, so I am good. Step eight is where everything comes to fruition. I actually prepare my financial statements. So I can make an income statement, statement of owner's equity, balance sheet, and statement of cash flows from all the transactions that I have um, had for this period. So who is going to use this information? Well, we've got our users of the financial statements, such as our banks. And our banks may be interested because they may be willing to lend us money. And then we've got um, our investors who may be interested in investing in our company so they would care about the financial health of our company the government who may want to find out whether or not we're paying the right amount of taxes so all these people are going to use our financial statements and financial statements are covered in chapters one two and three and if you need a tutorial on them I made a YouTube video and it's available right here alright at this point we are essentially finished with um, the financial statements and we are ready to get our books ready for the next period so this is called closing entries are journalized and posted to the general ledger. So in this situation, this was covered in the beginning of chapter four, we're going to close revenue to income summary, close income summary, or close salary expense to income summary, and then close income summary to capital. And then if we had drawing, we'd, we would also close it to capital. So we're not going to go over exactly how to do that, but I want you to see the big picture of it. So the big picture is that if you had a football game and you were to play out your whole game, at the very end, you would start the scoreboard back to zero. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to close our service revenue and our salary expense by dumping those numbers into capital and starting over so that we can find out how much service revenue and salary expense is in the current period. That's what the closing means. Since we just journalized and posted, what do we always do after we journalize and post to make sure that we're in balance? Yes, we have a post-closing trial balance. And what you'll notice about this is that it only lists those accounts that we don't close, the permanent accounts. Revenues and expenses have disappeared because they have a zero balance, so we just don't list them out here. And post-closing trial balance, the word post means after, so it is after we closed. This is our trial balance, and that is steps one through ten.